want me, want me to bring you a slice? I'm like your email to Dan. For the service. I will make sure you <laughs> hey, Matthew, is there anybody else out there that wants to be the, for the training? Um, I think there's one person. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that was subtle, wasn't it? Catherine, that's it. Yeah. You're gone. You're here for the trip. Yeah. Are you just, uh, the trip or? No, I don't think she goes to the trip. Oh, I have to sign too. Right, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the trade off. <laughs> Sacrifice 45 minutes so that you're not coming to the Right, right. <laughs> Scott, I'm ready when you are. Oh, okay, all right. So um, then let's get started. All right. So, um, good evening. Uh, this is uh, some board training for the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission here on September 18th. Uh, we're going to get started and maybe uh, let people somewhat close that door a little bit. Thank you. As soon as I can figure out how to work this. We're going to post the PowerPoint on our website yeah. and things like that. Yeah, I'll, uh, at the very end of this, I show you that there's a page on our website that has uh, kind of board member uh, materials, resources. Oh, that's good. Um, and so here, the four basic uh, topics I'm going to cover are kind of just the role as a citizen planner, which is probably not too much new to most of you. Uh, kind of the role of committees, the basic RPC and MPO duties is kind of distinct, um, and then. Just because we will inevitably use too many ac acronyms, we're going to give you a dose of acronyms, which is just our partners. <laughs> There's a lot of other. We are the most acronym heavy oh. organization in the history of mankind. Yeah. <laughs> Every industry has their acronyms, so. Um, so, uh, just in general, um, you know, as a a representative of your community, you know, we're hoping that you're communicating with your municipality or if you represent a constituency. So we also have a few members like Tom, you know, representing the agriculture community that, that we're hoping there's communication, uh, both informing them and getting their perspectives on what we're doing. Um, and then the second point is participating in one or more of our committees. Uh, we actually have that kind of written in our bylaws that there's I think we went past a hope and to an expectation. Um, it, it's not always possible for everybody to participate, but we do try to do that. And then, of course, participating in the full commission meetings uh, that happen monthly, or almost monthly. Um, and then just, just you know, kind of how to act. And please interrupt me if you have questions on anything along the way here. Um, that you know, we are conducting regular outreach with the public, so um, you know, we hope that. You, know, you feel as kind of a, a little bit of an emissary, you know, out there to either get us feedback, get perspectives, um, seeking input beyond our board members. Um, we don't want to just get in an echo chamber of listening to ourselves. Um, and certainly back to your legislative body uh, is very important. Um, I'm actually, you know, I kind of do a little gut check with that uh, every fall and go around to each select board and city council <coughs> and village trustees. Um, to just uh, you know, make sure that we're you know, being consistent with our members. Um, obviously, feedback, um, you know, is, if it can be constructive and timely, is, is more helpful. Um, and we're going to have diversity of thoughts and opinions on issues, and you know, it doesn't make them bad. They're just different, um, and we'll try to get to the right place. Um, the, the written communications, when you do those things, which are basically a report. Yep. To each one of the legislative bodies of the communities is, I think, really important because you started that about what seven or eight years ago, and before that, there wasn't anything like that. And so, lots of times, the legislative bodies were concerned about well, what is the MPO, what are, what are they doing, or the RPC do. Yep. And so that's that's a really important, important part of the communication. And for the new members, when Charlie goes to your legislative body, it's a good form to go with him. Um, to let them know who you are, or what some or, people or be are. There. Or be there. <laughs> some people are members of their yeah. of their select boards, but yeah. not everybody is. And yeah. so it's always good, especially for the, you know, um, for some of the, maybe not the core communities, but some of the rural communities. This is generally the only kind that I get to see. 
Yeah. Sometimes I feel like it's the only time you, each of the select boards is seeing me, but I'm thinking that's okay. Well, I'm talking about your commission members, too. But yeah. yeah. Outside of oh, your interview yeah. to get if, the job. If you're not on the yeah. select board, that's right. Yeah, and it is helpful, and I'm in that process right, process right now, and it is, it is, I find it really valuable to me and to the organization and just to make sure we're, you know, as well connected as we can be there. Um, uh, so then to, turning to uh, committees and kind of like, pulled up this quote, so some of this is some training that we've done before, but um, right, we merged the MPO and RPC, we're two separate organizations, two separate boards, they're legally two separate organizations. We merged in 2011, and uh, from a previous training, we had this quote from Mark Landry, who was, was on the Colchester Select Board at the time, and I can't remember if he was our chair or vice chair or past chair, but he was in that track. MPO. Yeah. And, um, you know, he really noted that you know, we need to uh, rely a little bit more on the committee structure because the board now had kind of twice as much business going to the board. Um, and so we really wanted to talk about using the committees as the primary re reviewer, ask them to really review an issue. Maybe even we send something back to a committee and say, can you, you know, update it? Or what about this perspective? Did you consider that? Um, but, and we want them to really focus attention on the most critical issues, um, kind of put things in their proper sequence and, and give the board sufficient information to make a decision. Um, so it's usually comes in some form of a recommendation from a committee. Um, and that's, a, that's the last bullet there. Um, and so now we get to start to get real word heavy and we're gonna get worse probably. Um, <laughs> but here are, I didn't count them, is there eight, nine, ten uh, committees? Um, so all but the last bullet are actually from our bylaws. So they're, you know, we already kind of legislated in our bylaws that we're going to have these committees. The executive committee, they meet every month, uh, kind of off <coughs> cycle from the board. So the board meets on the third Wednesday. The executive committee meets on the first Wednesday. Um, and they look at overall administration of, of the organization, including looking at the board agendas and uh, things coming to the board. Um, they're responsible for the personnel policy, um, uh, responsible for doing my evaluation. I probably should have included that in there. Um, and then also um, under our current policy, they review the Act 250 and Section 248 applications. Um, and stop if you have any questions on any of these committees or um, and that's you know that's the officers plus a rep for a large town and a small town so there's six members um, on the executive committee uh, finance committee is you know, typical what you would expect them to do they're looking mostly at the budget and audit uh, they often are meeting with the executive committee because we have uh, what, three members on the finance committee two of them are on the executive committee and then and Jeff so Sometimes he just joins the executive committee um, and they review things together. The board development committee, um, probably the, the thing they do every year is look at uh, nominations for officers. So they do that each spring. Um, they often, and they probably spurred on this training by saying, hey, we should do some training in the fall um, after we have new members particularly. And then um, also, as I look back in the bylaw, it also refreshed my memory that they are also responsible for reviewing the public participation plan, which we only update every so often. I think we're about five years out now. So um, we'll probably be looking that, at that in the next year or so. Uh, and that will come through that committee before it comes to the board. We then have um, what in our bylaws is called the Unified Planning Work Plan Committee or um, sometimes we call it the Unified Planning Work Program Committee. Um, but that's the work, that, that document, that UPWP is a document that guides our annual work. I'll go to that a little bit more later. Um, and that's, that committee only meets three times early in the calendar year to make a recommendation on the work, the work plan. The Transportation Advisory Committee, or the TAC, um, and this is, um, Tom, you were asking me about MPO business. Their primary work is looking at MPO business. So that's the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the Transportation Improvement Program. They also look at the uh, UPWP, and they also uh, approve consultant contracts 
Uh, so when we're hiring a consultant to do a transportation study, it runs through the TAC. The planning advisory committee, um, I'm, I'm sure, well, the other yeah, TAC, I'm trying to remember if I have more, if I got into more, no. So I couldn't remember if I had a page on each one of these committees, so I'm glad I don't. Um, we'll talk, we'll, uh, but the TAC is primarily the public works uh, folks from the towns. Um, sometimes there's a town administrator if it's a more rural town um, or a highway foreman or sometimes a town planner, uh, but typically it's the public works folks. The planning advisory committee, as you might expect, is the town planners. Um, we use them to, uh, they do kind of a peer review of municipal plans, make sure they're complied with statute. And uh, they also look at the Act 250, Section 248 review guidelines. So they recommend those to the board. Uh, we just updated those a year or so ago with new energy requirements. And then the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, that's a committee that only meets you know, every five or eight years. Um, and I'll talk about the regional plan and the metropolitan transportation plan a little bit more later. The Clean Water Advisory Committee is our newest formal committee. Uh, they look at the watershed basin plans, uh, which is something that the Agency of Natural Resources works on, and uh, also provide, um, they review assistance that we provide to the MS4 community, so feel free to flag me with acronym. Uh, but MS4 is a, a stormwater permit from DEC on our urban towns, um, and they have some common requirements that we help them out with that get reviewed by a subcommittee of the Clean Water Advisory Committee. And then we do ad hoc committees as needed. Uh, the most recent one's probably been uh, Act 250. We've had a committee uh, looking at what the state is doing for Act 250. So then a couple slides on... Can I ask a, oh, uh, sure. a stupid question? On committees? Yeah. Sure. Hi. How does one get on these committees? How does one get chosen to be you on? You are committees? asking that question the right night. <laughs> right, and I, I saw the email and still yeah. was like, how does this all happen? Yeah, um, and so, um, Harley, you raise your hand, <laughs> uh, so which is kind of what you saw, um, and then, the bylaws have some restrictions on the committees in terms of how many board members they have. Um, so it may be in part, like if somebody's kind of ready to trade and say, hey, you know, I'm on three committees, I can step yeah. off one, this is a great night to have that conversation. Okay. It's that simple. It's yeah, that, it's and that. then, yeah, and it's just, um, the chair is supposed to approve it, but the, the board concurs with the chair, I think is the phrase, I can't remember, or needs to approve what he does. The chair yeah, appoints and provides the information to the yeah, but it, but it literally says the board, as long as the board's board okay. concurs, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is run by the board. Has there ever been a time that the board no. has not concurred with the chair's appointments to committees? Not yet. Has there ever been a time when somebody really wanted a committee and didn't get it? Not uh, yet. Yeah. I don't know if there's a waiting list for any committee. I can tell you, no, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> In my yeah, whole experience, so, dating back to 2001 with the MPO, there has never been a waiting list if, for a committee. If you raise your hand with interest, there's a good chance you As a matter of fact, the problem is, is we have openings that yeah. shouldn't be there. Right. Or somebody's but, on multiple committees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, maybe, yeah, time to thank lose you. one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just starting with the RPC responsibilities, um, and this is a really generic kind of language that uh, comes out of state statute, uh, you know, doing studies and plans and recommendations on a broad set of issues, which you, could you get any more broad than that? Um, uh, you know, having staff and consultants uh, and, and working to provide information, carrying out uh, programs for the appropriate development and use of the region's physical and human resources, which is also pretty broad. Um, and then, or other acts that the, the RPC deems to be necessary or appropriate. So it's pretty broad you know, support for the municipalities on any issues. I usually uh, phrase it as uh, any issues of common interest to our uh, municipalities or maybe other members. Um, and then to uh, get a little bit more specific about some duties, it gets into uh, promoting mutual cooperation. So, which is, I think is probably a good think, way to think about it. Like we're, we're actually supposed to promote cooperation. Um, hopefully we're doing that in the work we do. 
Um, again, assisting and advising municipalities in plans and studies and bylaws <coughs> around the development of the region's physical and human resources. Uh, third bullet is a regional plan at least every eight years. So that's you know kind of a more formal document. Um, and I think I'll touch on this later, but, and I always remember, uh, I think there's 14 goals now and like 11 elements uh, that are required in state statute in the regional plan, something like that. Um, there's also a duty to review state capital expenditures. We mostly focus on that on the transportation side. Um, we uh, have a duty to appear before the District Environmental Commission to aid in Act 250 review and before the, this is Public Service Board, but I think that was the Public Utility Commission, the PUC, sorry, I didn't update that. That was, that was probably my error. To, uh, for Section 248. Do we have to amend the bylaws there? No, no, this is state statute, so this, okay. is, this is my, my fault uh, for using an old training presentation. <laughs> so, um, and then also uh, with regard to municipal plans, uh, re reviewing that they are, have a, a good planning process, approve the municipal plan, and then the newest thing is these determinations of energy compliance. Um, so those are RPC duties. Um, oh, here, here's just a, a slide on some of the major ones. Um, the regional plan, the 14 goals, 11 elements. The our <coughs> regional plan also includes our metropolitan transportation plan, which for federal law addresses 10 planning factors, uh, which are pretty re similar and related. Uh, we also have embedded in our <coughs> eco plan the comprehensive economic development strategy, which GBIC does a, a kind of another layer of adoption as the Regional Development Corporation to address an EDI. Uh, GBIC, does everybody know what that is? You know, the Greater Burlington Industrial Corporation. Um, and EDA is the Economic Development Administration, which is a federal agency that has the requirements for what is supposed to be in the Comprehensive Economic Development if Strategy. If you have a SEDS, you get invited to do a SEDS, it's a SEDS they call it, then you can petition for federal government funding assistance for your infrastructure program. If you don't have a SEDS, you don't get the preferred consideration for it. Just basically a ploy or a means to compete for federal funds. Yeah. It's all about positioning for federal funds. Uh, um, and certainly the MTP and the SEDS are both have their federal agency requirements that help you compete for federal funds. Um, or in the case of the MTP, well, I think I'll get more to that when I talk about the, M the MPO strategies. The I other want to pieces. Remind us of one thing, if you don't mind, yeah. We basically support planning that's well done. Okay. We sometimes lose sight of that when we get down into the minutia. I mean, we are advocates of good, high quality planning by our partners and municipal organizations. When we get into MPO, I think we're more, we're in both. Our RPC and our MPO functions are support constituency, support services for our member municipalities. But I think it's more towards that in the MPO portion than in the RPC part of our work. Just bigger in the MPO side. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and some other key components of the the ECOS plan is, and newest is the energy plan. It's also um, where we uh, document our future land use map, which is you know something that uh, is kind of central to our planning for the you know, orderly development of the region, um, which is really uh, also built on municipal zoning. So it's also a place where we kind of have a map that uh, we generalize the municipal zoning. So that's not what your zoning looks like, but if you you know attach all the zoning maps to each other, it would look pretty close to that. Um, municipal plan review. Uh, so that's, I think we have one on tonight. Um, we often, uh, and so here's, uh, here's some of the direct service on the RPC side, the land use side we provide to towns, is often around their municipal plans. Uh, whether it's mapping or data. Um, and so this is probably most of the land use technical assistance is, is with regard to town plans. Um, and, and we have done the full full range of services there, all the way to writing. I think at Six Junction, I think we just did quite a bit of help. Um, is, is one example in Bolton last year. Um, 
And then, um, and then under under again under Vermont law requires us to review the planning process of each municipality at least twice during the eight year period, um, and so that's something uh, that we've kind of uh, described in that there's a guidelines document. Uh, there's a much longer name, which I'm not even going to try. I don't even know if Regina can come up with that. No. Uh, see, it's so long, <laughs> not even Regina, but it's. The guidelines for reviewing municipal plans and energy determinations and a couple other things. <laughs> that link um, will go right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and but one part of just to point out what what we've done to kind of satisfy this two reviews in eight years is say we'll we'll uh, sit down with your planning commission like eighteen to twenty four months before you're going to do your plan and kind of give you some front end give your Planning Commission or your planner, some uh, just front end input, particularly if there's a new state statute. Like we've had uh, certainly years in the past 10 years where the legislature's added a new requirement to, for an economic development section of town plans that didn't exist before. So we'll be like, hey, there's a new section that's required now. Please don't forget to include that as you're updating your plan. Uh, so we do that you know, a couple of years in advance, and then we do uh, kind of a more formal one when you have a draft. Um, and hopefully that's that's more. We're trying to build uh, a system of cooperation, <laughs> so hopefully we're just at that point just affirming like, okay, you did, you updated those things. You should have updated. Did we won't have a problem approving it when it comes to the RPC board. Um, and then um, going down one more level from plan down to like permitting stage. Um, there's a, just a couple sections on Act 250 and Section 248, um, and you see the language here again about this duty to respond to appear before uh, the District Environmental Commissions about as to the conformance of development subdivisions with, and this talks about the criteria of 10 VSA with Act 250, but it's really Criteria 10, which says these um, Act 250 applications need to be consistent with the regional plan, and so that's what. Um, and we've got some more guidance. Again, there's a, a guideline document that the board's approved at the bottom there that talks about how we do that, you know, what are we looking at in our plan to get to that kind of determination. Um, and then pretty similarly, we're looking at the same kinds of things for Section 248, although that has gotten um, a little bit more expanded now with these uh, enhanced uh, energy standards. And so you see that third bullet under Section 248 where we got a determination of energy compliance last year. Um, and so we're supposed to get uh, a higher level of um, consideration of our recommendations with regards to whether uh, energy project complies with our plan. Do you want to add to that? Questions. And so you'll see in this, like in this board packet, at the end of the packet was all of those letters that the executive committee has approved in the last probably the last two months because it's been two months since we've had a board meeting which is why there were so many of those letters attached to this board packet um so again it was, we still think a little bit in terms of rpc uh, responsibilities and mpo responsibilities so these responsibilities come from more federal law as opposed to the rpc comes from state law um, and what is the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which now I'm realizing isn't spelled out here, uh, but that's a, a federal regulation, federal law term that says there needs to be uh, a representative group of local stakeholders that leads the transportation planning process <coughs> in the metropolitan area. Um, though that group, which is really this board, um, and this was formed in the early 80s by agreement of the governor and the municipalities formed that group here. Uh, which is the RPC now, um, and it's the policy-making organization responsible for <coughs> prioritizing transportation initiatives, uh, and it carries out the metropolitan transportation plan process in cooperation with VTrans and GMT. So it's federal law is very clear. You got it. It's the DOT, the transit agency, and the municipalities through the MPO uh, working together. <coughs> Are there, aren't there? population thresholds and things like that laid out yep. in federal law for an area that can be yeah. a metropolitan planning organization. We're yeah, the only one in Vermont. Yeah, that's probably not a bad thing and to talk about. And there was some concern that maybe Hartford 
Lebanon, New Hampshire, um, White River Junction area might be part of that. And we have another census coming up. So that, yeah. that could be uh, possible uh, another thing to think about whether or not there could end up being another MPO in our state and in New Hampshire. I'm gonna, you may know this better than I do, but I'm, I'm fairly confident they haven't reached that urban population. Probably they haven't, and, 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 and um, <coughs> they could also adjust the thresholds like they did last time um, yeah. when we did a census, but we got a census coming up, so it's something for us not to be completely oblivious to. So uh, Jeff is making reference to, uh, to become, uh, the federal law defines an MPO as any urbanized area, which census definition is 1,000 persons per square mile, so that's when you hear urban, that's what that generally means. Um, and uh, if you have more than 50,000 urban population, um, our urban population, our urbanized area looks, looks pretty similar to these colors here, the pink and purple. And, uh, so that uh, Jeff referred to them as core towns, but it's you know Colchester, Essex, Winooski, uh, out to Williston. Uh, South Burlington, Shelburne, and that's that's pretty much our urbanized area. There's 110,000 or so people in that urbanized area, so we're well above 50. Uh, but there's definitely um, a couple of things, you know, at the federal level. Sometimes they've talked about raising that threshold for MPO funds to 100,000. I think thankfully we'd be just over that if they did that. Um, but there are a lot of small MPOs around the country that would get impacted, and then the other impact. Right now, we're the only MPO in Vermont, so we get 100% of the MPO funding. Um, if there were to be another MPO in Vermont, there's that same pot is the same size, so we would probably see a drastic. So we have planning responsibilities for both the MPO and as the RPC, and we have agreements with state funded through ACCD to do a lot of that stuff, plus grant funding that we get. But we have a planning grant to execute a lot of our planning responsibilities. Yeah, the, non, the non MPO stuff. And yeah. then for the MPO, we our office operations for our MPO activities are covered through filing a reasonable budget with the AOT um, that use the support keep the lights on and support our staff and to execute on the planning money, uh, the planning dollars for the projects that we do, which is why we always like to have good productivity from our consultants so that we're making sure that the VAOT understands that for the overhead that they're paying for us to have our operation, we're actually at product throughput going. So, yeah, so and um, I didn't include a slide on, on our budget. Would that be helpful or just like introductory to get a sense of, and maybe, maybe we'll talk about that next Those are two major next sources month. of funding, and when yeah. we talk about we'll talk whether we're gonna do something or not, it's always, is that within the purview of our agency of commerce yeah. and community Development budget and is that all? Is, is that covered by what we do for MPO or do we have to go get a grant right. to cover that work? Um, so I'm going to add that to the list of maybe that's uh, we'll maybe dig into a little more detail, um, kind of how we operate next month. Um, so basic MPO duties, um, you'll hear you may hear a reference to a 3C planning process that's continuing, comprehensive, cooperative, um, and then address the 10. FAST Act, so FAST Act is the federal transportation law. Um, they change the name on it every, I don't know, every four or eight years or six or seven or some, who knows, but whenever I think. they pass a new one. Yeah, whenever they pass a new one, that's probably a better way to say it. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> You're not holding your breath, are you? Uh, they're working on one again. Yeah, right. Um, so. Um, and they don't lie to the public. And <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then when you see there will be items on the agenda that are referred to as MPO business items, uh, that has specific implications in terms of um, who gets to vote, but those items, just to talk about the items for a minute, are the work program, uh, which is you, gets voted on annually in May, the transportation improvement program, uh, which federal law says you gotta do at least every four years, but functionally we do it every year. We typically do it in July after the legislature has gotten done approving the capital program and so we you know, kind of align things with VTRANS uh, at that time. But then there's also amendments that occur during the year, so you see uh, one of those uh, on tonight's agenda. And then the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, we have to update every five years, we just did that in 2018. And a Public Participation Plan, I mentioned earlier, we last did that in 2014, 
So we'll probably update that or take a look at it, see if it needs to be updated uh, pretty soon. Um, and just to dig into those a little bit more, uh, the UPWPs, the work plan for the year, we solicit projects around Thanksgiving time and ask to get um, what the municipality wants by the end of January. Um, <clears throat> the UPWP committee meets typically three times. We kind of meet February, March, April, um, and recommend it to the board. And then it goes through other committees, the finance committee and the executive committee, um, and to the board. You see a draft in April, typically vote on it in May. Um, and our fiscal year starts in July. So that's just our mm -hmm. annual really budget work program. And when we talk about work program, I think our work program ends up Amy who knows this better than I do, probably uh, like 190 specific tasks are on our timesheets. Uh, not on each person, hopefully, but, um, but between the, um, you know, the 16 or 17 of us, we're at some point during the year working on 190 different uh, individual tasks that we build time to. Um, I just, I'll get into maybe this, maybe more next month, but operationally, we really act <laughs> Um, we don't have general fund revenue like we don't you know we don't tax and people get just get paid for 40 hours a week um, we actually operate really more as a, a billing I think it was as a public sector consulting agency really uh, we have every one of those work program items typically has some sort of performance contract with it. the biggest ones with VTrans which is you know almost two-thirds of our budget uh, but it's a, but it's still a performance contract there's all these tasks that we say we're going to do for X amount of money. And we have to do them. Yeah. Uh, and that's what you said you wanted to do. So um, the transportation improvement program is kind of the multi-year list. And this, you know, aligns quite a bit with the state's capital uh, program. Um, but it's, you know, has a specific designation that we need to approve it here at the RPC. Um, it's got to be, we update it annually. so. Here you see some of the federal requirements that are you know, be updated no less frequently than two years. Uh, must prioritize them and, and have clearly identified funding sources. Um, and so the next to last bullet is all those things. In, in order for them to get federal funds, they must be approved by the board here. So, um, you know, the power there is, I think it was almost a negative power, you know, if they're, um, and, th and this is really rooted in the history of MPOs, why MPOs exist. It's really from the 60s interstate highway, you know, uh, <coughs> DOTs building interstates through municipalities that didn't really want them to happen. And so this is, in essence, more like a veto power. If VTrans, and this is not at all happening, <laughs> but if VTrans was you know, proposing to put a road through <laughs> our region that you know, the communities, the local leaders did not want, this is a way to say, okay, you can't use federal funds for that. Why not? Go all the way back to the 60s for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It hasn't happened for a while. Um, and then um, we, we, you may see um, the airport's federal funds, the FAA funds listed in our tip, but they're not subject to our, our review, really, but we just kind of list them for informational purposes. Um, thought that would be good for I you. Think the other thing that's important for people to understand is that's a constrained budget. Yeah. It has to fit within a certain resource allocation, so that's why frequently you see amendments up front because if we have to move funding around for changing circumstances, um, you know, we have to actually act to make sure that the, uh, the TIP, which becomes part of the state's transportation improvement program when we approve it, would be sent with the vote from VTrans. For those of you that are in this, usually Matthew from VTrans and yeah. Christine from the RPC usually. Christine is the do, guru. Do of some the coordination along with Amy. To make sure those things all, all happen. <laughs> Hopefully not. They're the wizards of the uh, The MTP. Isn't that like the salary cap for uh, yeah, the maybe. or something like that? Maybe. Yeah. All right, let me get through these last couple. Um, <laughs> the MTP is our long range transportation plan. Um, this also, the last bullet, uh, also has to be financially constrained. So even though we're looking out 20 years, um, it, we, we look at you know what's realistic in terms of budget, in terms of what we can afford here in this region. Uh, as I mentioned, we just updated la last last year. This also uh, any no projects with using federal funds can be done in this region unless they're in or consistent with our MTP. 
the public participation plan is kind of what you might guess it is. Um, uh, and it's kind of a resource for how we uh, reach out and engage with community members. Um, and there's also a kind of a big focus on inclusive community engagement and doing more to reach out to community members that may not you know, normally participate in a Tuesday night meeting. Um, and then partners, um, I've mentioned some of these, GBIC, the Chamber, uh, VHFA, uh, ACCD, these are mostly like RPC side partners, uh, Agency of Commerce, Natural Resources, Emergency Management at Department of Health, uh, and then transportation partners, you can see some you know, the top ones are where money flows to us or through us, VTrans, Federal Highway, FTA, That's and then, yeah. yeah, and then GMT, you know, Green Mountain Transit, uh, CATMA is the Transportation Management Association, um, and then include locomotion car share. So some of these are probably familiar to you, but um, we have some some sort of relationship with all those organizations. And then here's the board member resource page, um, and so. Uh, you know, there's kind of about us. If you go to that that mm -hmm. heading and go to commission, commission, and commissioners, um, you'll see some of these training uh, uh, powerpoints and the handbook, the bylaws, responsibilities. So, and here's where it kind of asks about. So I got kind of like doing a little bit of deeper budget operational dive, uh, which maybe you know feel a little bit like UPWP approval. <laughs> of seeing what we're actually working on this year and maybe a little bit of how our budget works. Any other things, any other? Last year we did a little bit more deeper on the MPO. Uh, any well, the other thing I think that's important for folks is on the back of your agenda, yep. what we're trying to do is give you a little bit of a warning about the issues that are coming up in future board meetings. So if anybody has a question, I mean, can talk to the staff. I'm happy to talk to anybody um, if you don't mind potentially being a little misled. Um, <laughs> not by not by not by commission, but maybe by omission <laughs> and inadvertently. Rarely, um, rarely happens. Or, or I might have a different take than the normal board member on things. But I take my board development committee assignment seriously, and I believe in these orientation sections, sessions uh, very strongly. And the, the dinners can actually get better over the course of things to, to try to keep you from uh, to keep you from not attending these. These are very important, and it's important that you understand the distinction between RPC things and MPO things, so that you know, for example, you you know, as one of the representatives of one of the industries, you don't you should probably understand the MPO stuff. But since you don't have to vote, you know, right. you maybe don't have to get as deeply into that as the other. The other planning things, and alternates we encourage to be on committees because that's a really good way to learn about what's going on. Um, and, and since we're we tend to be a committee centric organization, that's where all the detailed stuff goes on um, that we don't get to talk about at the board level. And you can be a more effective board member if you do understand the detail behind. Other thoughts or questions you can think of at this point that might be helpful for. Next month, or you guys are just trying to be nice. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Maybe we'll take a couple minute break. And, yep. I have a question. Oh, for, for no. Charlie or for me? <coughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah I noticed in the. So, next month, we're going to have another one, and then the month after that. I guess we'll see if, if, if folks will want one. Well, like I said, if the so, food gets better, we'll yeah, get better chances. It was blank. By the time we get to the last one, we have steak. Oh, no, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, wait, 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 on that. That's what we tell you anyway. Oh, I just yeah. You yeah. see, when I looked at my packet, it said. Yeah, because this happened since the packet went out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Wayne's going on. It's back there. We have Jack and Murphy going on. Oh, okay. Get no one for report development. I think you're probably right. Yeah. That was, but that was in the 90s. Oh, well, no, I was there. For we don't really need one. Oh, that's right. Oh, no problem. We got a number of iron. Yeah, so we're in pretty good shape. We got this plank, but we don't really need it. Does that mean you're doing it? All right. 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 All right
That's why. That's why I'm at. That was right there. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Yeah, two meetings. Irvin, Whitman. Oh, they moved me back the over here. The tech meeting. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. there for that one. Yeah, office. Vacation. Yeah, yeah I, I, someone said that Nick. I can just talk to him here. I just stole. Bars. Yeah, bars. Yep. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. What up? Grab a seat at the machine. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Hey, Michael Bryan, how are you doing? Do you want to just take the lead on the presentation? Any questions or you want to come through me? I'll leave that whatever you yeah. whatever you I'll wish. Yeah. Okay. I think a I'll give it to you back. Thank you for coming. Oh, wow. Yeah. Since you're quiet and down. So we have a yeah, yeah. we have a quorum and we have a minutes taker. Amy, you're good? All right. <laughs> good. Okay, we'll call this meeting to order. And the first item is uh, public com oh, changes to the agenda. I'm sorry. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to public comment period for uh, items not on tonight's agenda. Anyone from the public want to address the board? Seeing no one, move on. 
Uh, next is action on consent agenda, and we have one item. So I'm looking for a, is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Just for new members that may not be aware, when there's a consent agenda, we have no discussion. If you want it pulled for discussion, we can pull it and make it an action item, but otherwise we do what we just did. Okay, minutes of the July 17th, 2019 meeting. Looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Catherine, is there a second? Second. Second by Jeff. Any comments? Jeff. Um, the minutes note that the Essex Junction is absent, and I'm the second alternate for Essex Junction, and I was here. Okay. And then we, um, there's a recorded vote on the on MPO business that also reflected that Essex Junction was absent, but I was here and I voted in the affirmative. We didn't even go around the room because it was in Right. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing nothing, all in favor of the motion to approve the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And it's passed. Next item, Burlington International Airport draft noise comp compatibility plan. We have Nick Longo here from the airport. Nick is going to do the presentation, and I think, Nick, you said you'd like to have a conversation type thing, so yeah, I if think you have questions, funny. you just have Nick respond. Oh, yeah. It will be that. Oh, okay. Good. It will be once we get Everybody huddle around uh, over here. <laughs> there you go. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you again. My name is Nick Longo. I'm the Deputy Director of Aviation at the Burlington International Airport. Uh, before I jump right into the noise exposure map, and thank you for the invite, Charlie and, and Michael. Um, at any time, if the board wishes to hear updates uh, from the Burlington Airport, uh, uh, Larry Lackey sitting over there is our director of engineering, and I would be uh, very happy to present some of the uh, some of our capital improvements and capital plans moving forward. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I can't give too much information because it's not uh, public yet. But we are in preparation to receive one of our largest grants in the history of the airport this week uh, from the, from the federal government, uh, which will help. Uh, some of the geometry issues uh, that we have out on the airfield. So again, I'd be happy to present that. Tonight, though, I, I was asked to uh, give a brief update on our noise exposure map, uh, more specifically our noise compatibility program. Uh, there's a, a lot of acronyms and a lot of uh, uh, things that I might uh, uh, quickly throw in there, so please stop me if, if, I, uh, if I say those too often or if you're not sure what I'm referring to and again I, I I'd, I'd love to have a conversation versus a presentation so if there is a question as I move along please feel free to uh, uh, stop me if, if uh, the chair is okay with that um, so what I refer to in in all of this uh, noise programs that that I that we uh, handle at the airport is what's called part 150 for sure and that's that's really just a, a short name for uh, where it comes from in the federal uh, regulations, 14 CFR Part 150. Uh, there's multiple parts to that, and, and I'm going to get into that in, uh, in just a second. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of where the history has been over the last decade or so, uh, and, and uh, uh, where, of course, we're, we're going to go. Uh, this is actually a very appropriate re uh, week to have this conversation. Uh, tomorrow, the F-35A aircraft are going to be landing at the Burlington Airport, uh, which is one of the reasons, uh, one of the primary reasons that the uh, uh, new noise exposure map was produced uh, very recently. Uh, you can see there, I won't uh, go through the list there, but we've, we've actually been doing our Part 150 program for a few decades, uh, but over the last 10 years, we've uh, uh, updated what we call our Noise Compatibility Program, or NCP for short. And most recently, this year, we published our latest noise exposure map. Just because there may be a lot of people watching this on television, can you explain what Part 150 is? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what is a Part 150 noise study? Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 you guys, Corey. I obviously didn't see the presentation in advance. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, and I, I just wanted to start with that history because, uh, great question, because right away it, it kind of breaks down to 
um, those different aspects of a Part 150 process. Uh, uh, in, this, in this context, I'm going to break it down into two parts. Uh, one is that noise compatibility uh, part. Now, excuse me, one, and the first thing that is completed is our noise exposure map, which is just that, an actual map depicting contour lines of average decibel levels uh, around the airport. Followed by that map is what's called a noise compatibility program, or what to do within those contour lines on that map. Uh, so that part 150 is broken down into the, those two aspects. Uh, what is a noise exposure map? I, I, I briefly went through that. So that is uh, what you see in the picture there, and it is a land use map that has contour lines broken down, um, required by FAA, broken down into certain decibel levels or average decibel levels. Uh, the picture shows a little bit more than that, and I, I do have very large pictures as we go forward in the presentation so you can see the latest noise exposure map that we uh, published recently which includes all aircraft at the airport, but most, uh, I think most, uh, for most people, the F-35A aircraft is included in that latest uh, uh, edition of the noise exposure map. Yes, sir. Could you define uh, what an average uh, noise level or average sound level might be? Is that, does that average, for example, a condition where no planes are landing or taking off with time when a plane is landing or taking off, or how is that computed? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, great question. So the average noise is uh, a weighted average over a 24-hour period. And there are some, uh, whoops, I might have missed it, but there are some uh, penalties, if you will, uh, uh, after a certain time and before a certain time in the morning. So, uh, for example, that 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., uh, there is a, a penalty on that average 24-hour weighted um, uh, definition. I actually have a little... I have it somewhere in here, and there it is. So, so you can see here, uh, kind of in a graphical a depiction, taking all of those single events of noise over that 24-hour period on the right-hand side there, anything occurring beyond 10 p.m. before 7 a.m. gets that 10 decibel penalty, and then is averaged uh, over that 24-hour period to come up with um, what you what you generally read about is the 65, 70, or 75 uh, dB DNL, which is it's, DNL stands for that uh, day night level average. And 10 decibels is a doubling of the sound, right? The, the yeah, it's it's generally a twofold or doubling of that sound. Yeah, correct. your slide before is a tenfold. So uh, what did I just say? Twofold, well, tenfold. Well, in the line item bullet point, it's a tenfold. Yeah, it's the opposite. Double the decibels is ten times the sound. Right, right there. Right, the tenfold. Yeah. What did I say? Twofold? Well, is it ten times or is it two times? That's the penalty, I think. Well, we understand the penalty. Yeah. A ten decibel increase is, is generally a, a significant increase. So I, I don't know exactly what, what the, the times is, but it's a significant increase in the decibel levels. But it's not tenfold. It's ten decibels. Yes. That's what I'm pointing out. The second gotcha. bullet from the bottom is a 10 decibel penalty. It should, it should read 10 decibel yeah. penalty. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And there you go. This, this actually answered your question a little bit better on what that average day-night sound level is uh, and what those contour levels, which I think we've already uh, discussed a little bit. Uh, this is a requirement of the FAA, so FAA requires those three contour lines be displayed on the, the land use map, the 65, 70, and the 75, and, and I'll show that in more detail in just one sec. And as long as we're talking on the FAA requirements, uh, Nick, what triggers an NEM and or an NCP? Great question, yeah. Um, and how often do they need to be renewed? I mean, we're under, you know, for our ECOS plan, you know, we update it uh, on set schedules, so yep. how does this happen? Yeah, uh, very similar. Uh, we, we generally plan for it, of course, financially in a, in a set schedule, typically around every five years. The FAA likes to at least confirm every five years that the operations of the airport are, are uh, accurate to what our noise exposure map depicts. Uh, so generally every five years. Now, when there's a, a uh, significant change in the operation at the airport, 
whether that's a commercial operation, a new uh, tenant maybe that comes in and, and is starting operating more commercial or private aircraft, uh, or in our case, when a new military aircraft arrives and is flying out of the airport. Then it justifies a, a, a new noise exposure map to be updated. And again, this is, this is the requirement of the FAA to confirm the actual operations of this airport. So there isn't a set time, but the practice has been five years other than change of operation. The, the FAA likes to see typically every five years. And then does that, by its nature, the NEM trigger an NCP following on? Not necessarily. So typically the NCP might follow multiple noise exposure map uh, additions or, or, or uh, changes. There's no uh, time frame for when that has to change or be updated. Right, right. Uh, However, in our particular case, uh, we, meaning the City of Burlington and the Burlington International Airport, as well as the community members and the leadership around the airport, logically uh, removing all of the incompatible land uses, which, which in other words, removing the residential land uses, is not really a viable option, nor do, nor do we want to see that happen. Uh, so in our existing noise exposure map, which we got approval, uh, received approval in 2008 from the FAA, most of the removal of the incompatible land uses was actual demolition of the house. So this is why we also, this year into next, want to revise our noise compatibility program for the other programs that, are, that I'm going to outline in, in just a few minutes. Did, did that answer your question? I think so. So just, just a, a recap of where we are on our noise exposure map. Uh, uh, most of this is already completed. You can see most of this calendar is, is from 2018 into the uh, back half of 2019. We're generally uh, just past that orange uh, um, bar there in, into the lower final column uh, and finishing our noise exposure map. We had multiple public hearings, one at the airport, one actually right down the road at the O'Brien Community Center a few months ago. Well, we compiled uh, uh, some comments from those uh, public hearings as well as received about a 30-day comment period. Uh, now what we're doing is, is completing the noise exposure map, which is not just the maps itself. It's, uh, it, as with many planning documents, there's a significant amount of effort behind those maps, and, and the document itself is, is quite extensive, going into the details of how the map is produced and why it was changed. Uh, we're actually within days now uh, 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 of submitting this final noise exposure map to the FAA. Uh, the FAA reviews it, uh, s some of the technicalities of it, and accepts that as our new noise exposure map. Uh, once that's uh, published in the Federal Register and the FAA accepts it, that becomes the official noise expo exposure map of the airport. And then the noise compatibility program follows on what to do with those contour lines. Now, currently, is the map based upon modeling or actual measurements, and is that going to change over time? The, all, this the great great question. Yeah. So all of our noise exposure maps are produced with modeling, uh, computer modules, uh, as required by FAA. Uh, so for example, we don't have the F-35A aircraft here, so we have to computer uh, model that in a computer software system, uh, which is the only way the FAA uh, accepts these noise exposure maps. We produce multiple maps. We produce an existing condition map. Uh, which of course is not going to have uh, many military aircraft. Our map was as of the end of 2018 and was during the drawdown of the F-16s. Uh, and then we produce a five-year future forecast. And that one, of course, is going to show the full compilation of the F-35A aircraft operating uh, per the Air National Guard and the Department of Defense. And then at some point, is it going to convert from assumed values for the F-35A to actual measured values? Or no, it's it's always going to be a computer model, uh, which is which is the way that the FAA accepts these maps. Uh, however, one year after full deployment of the F-35s, uh, as as we had the conversation earlier, we typically uh, redo our maps every five years. But one year after the F-35s arrive, so full F-35s arrive by the end of next year, so uh, 2020. 
first arrival tomorrow, all 20 of them are going to be arrived by the end of 2020. One year after that, so 2021, we're going to update this noise exposure map with actual operational data, actual radar data, uh, uh, to confirm or, or edit if we, if we need to these, these noise exposure. And we'll do the same thing. We'll have an existing conditions map and then a future forecast for that time period. Because when it goes to the updating, I think there's been conversations with South Burlington about 24-hour noise monitoring <coughs> in the airport. Is that something that uh, is going to be accelerated or is still an option? Uh, well, that's a, that's a hard one uh, to fund from the FAA, uh, the actual 24-hour monitoring, uh, because these are the only regulated maps that they'll accept so that we can apply for federal funding to mitigate. Right, and I'm just wondering if under the umbrella of the FAA funding with 150, whether that, yes, we understand they accept only computer modeling, but for the purposes of your NCP, can that monies be crept in under the NCP? Of actual sound, actual uh, sound let's say, um, uh, microphones which or whatever. Which I think, an issue and would, would be valuable beyond the computer modeling. To confirm, uh, you know, geographically in that. It's an ongoing measure. It just seems like it's been completely missed, and it's needed, and it's been identified as being needed for the last five years. It's just a question of who's going to pay for it and uh, how it can be implemented. You certainly have done studies with these consultants <clears throat> in which you've paid them to go around and put plant uh, listening, you know, measures for them, and you've got metadata out there for actual readings, but to have that in a more digestible format uh, would be very helpful. I mean, it seems like whatever we had before was out there, but it wasn't presented in a way that you could easily pull the data together and see what it represented. And that just probably was a measure of the fact that you didn't have the, the uh, dollars to have people pull together that data and do it, uh, or maybe they didn't want that data out there. I don't know. But it would be helpful if it was a little more transparent and we had some real numbers to look at rather than the computer modeling. Although the com computer modeling has been good for weather, <laughs> I think people would just like to kick the tires. <clears throat> and and that, that would be an extensive study because uh, relative your, to your geographic location, it, it would take an extensive amount of, of resources, time, and, and uh, effort to put those documents together. There was a, a, a test done a few years ago. That's the one I'm referring yeah, to. Um, uh, which the data wasn't really used for the FAA. It was used for their studying, from my knowledge, to incorporate into these noise exposure, or into these computer modules. Um, uh, and again, it, it's difficult, from my understanding also, to receive federal grants to actually monitor that noise. Because again, the, the FAA is looking for these planning these land use maps and these uh, computer modeled contour maps so that we can apply for federal grant funding uh, to mitigate or to, or to do whatever the noise compatibility program outlines. Um, so it would be extensive. We, we have heard that in the past. We have uh, played around uh, with it in our noise compatibility program in the past and potentially in the future, but we're also trying to give uh, the most tools and, and uh, the most financial means of applying for federal grants to mitigate the noise within those contour lines. Do you have some sense of a definition of extensive resources? I, I don't. Uh, it, both financially and, and staff-wise and consultant-wise, as well as it would be difficult to actually receive the federal funding uh, if that's even eligible. Yeah, I was really going when you say it's going to be extensive, which means expensive. I'm after, like, what's expensive mean? Yeah, I, I don't know that right right now, but uh, we can look into it a little bit more. Uh, our goal, though, is is to uh, access federal funding to help mitigate uh, the residents within that area so one other uh, in this contour line. I don't live in South Burlington, but um, the one time I heard an F-35, I didn't know what it was. I live in Richmond, which is pretty far away, and I heard a really loud, unusual no noise and walked outside my house to try to figure out what it was. And it was, a, as it turned out, it was an F-35. So I'm thinking the residents who are close by might be interested in actual experience and not only average, but maybe peak decibel values um, as opposed to average computer models. I mean, if I live near the airport, that's probably how I do it. 
again, it's it's all relative to where you live, right? And and uh, both terrain-wise, geographically, and and proximity to the airport. So, I, I think that's where I was getting at the the extensive part of of uh, actually studying peak noise at a particular residence, because your neighbor or the one behind you is going to experience something different. Yeah. And and uh, yeah. I have a question about the schedule here. You notice you had public comment over the summer on the noise exposure map. Um, and I got asked by one of the city managers, uh, like, how do they know if the comments were accepted or part of the map? Is there, is there any um, thing that they could review before you send it into the FAA? Or? We're, we're going to publish that on our website. And every original comment is part of our actual document. Every email comment is part of our document too, and then if there was edits that were needed to be based on comments or, or whatnot, those are incorporated and or answered. Uh, we're also going to have a, 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 a table format answering any questions or similar questions uh, grouped together, uh, which will also be available on our website. And I think this is mostly just about what's on the map of making sure the public facilities and things that. So, so if they commented like, "Oh, you're missing a school," absolutely, that got added. To the map. Absolutely, yeah, because we want to make sure whether you know there's an in-house daycare or, or a new use of a, uh, of a building, uh, w whether it's municipal owned or, or privately owned, is incorporated in the map because that will eventually determine the eligibility of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, before I move on to NEM, is it any or excuse me, the NCP noise compatibility program? Any any more questions on the noise exposure map? All right, so the, so the next step uh, for this Part 150 is to complete a noise compatibility program. Uh, we've been working with uh, what we've uh, uh, um, uh, classified as a technical advisory committee for approximately one year. Uh, this, this committee is made up of uh, uh, RPC as well as uh, uh, local leadership from the municipality surrounding the airport, school districts, uh, uh, and, and it really outlines, uh, again, what the NCP is going to detail or what we want to do within those contour lines. What federal effort and federal eligibility is there to access funding to mitigate the noise within those contour lines. Uh, we've, de uh, we've determined a few uh, items as part of that NCP process, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in just a few, uh, few slides. Um, and that technical advisory committee is, is uh, uh, helped out tremendously on, on kind of formulating that those ideas. Uh, the NCP will also be published. Another public hearing will occur later this year, and another public uh, comment period will be opened up for uh, residents. Uh, one of the the uh, one of the things we've heard time and time again from the FAA is, while it's extremely important that we hear from the municipalities as, and the and the planning. Uh, uh, the, the RPC, uh, it, it is just as, if not even more important to hear from the actual residents or incompatible land uses within the area. So we're, we're going to have an extensive outreach to make sure that the residents within this contour area are aware of what the next steps are, uh, are aware of what we're proposing as mitigation efforts, and we, we continue to propose additional items so that residents don't have to choose just a single mitigation effort, but there's multiple items that they may be able to choose from. Well, again, uh, Nick, if the residents in their comments suggested, as Bard just pointed out, that they'd like to know what's the incidence of peak noise yes. and the impact of peak noise, and that's not available in the computer modeling, or maybe it is, um, you know, how is that going to be made available or, you know, can three hundred thousand dollars for a setup of right. that kind of monitoring we talk about um, be implemented as part of the noise compatibility program? It, I, I believe it can. The FAA. Yeah, I believe it can. I, it can be a recommendation in the NCP. Uh, it, it may delay things um, uh, based on uh, federal funding first being used for uh, a sound monitoring system versus uh, being put into, let's say, a sound uh, insulation program for residential mm -hmm. houses. But, but it absolutely could be a recommendation within our noise compatibility program. And, and if, if those are the comments that, that we receive, then, then we'll absolutely address them and, and uh, 
uh, put those into the plan if necessary. Uh, here's our, our NCP as of uh, the beginning of this year. Uh, again, we've been working with our advisory committee for, for quite some time. Uh, we are just in the October 2019 time frame, which I, there we go, which is a, this diamond right here, uh, which is just about ready to publish and distribute a, a draft noise compatibility program. Tomorrow night is uh, uh, one of our technical advisory committees and potentially our last advisory committee to wrap up those, those uh, proposed mitigation uh, uh, efforts. Uh, like I said, after that, we'll publish the, the actual document itself and the recommendations within that document and open up a public comment period uh, uh, with a public hearing. Um, respond to those comments and submit those final NCB comments to the FAA. The FAA, by regulation, is this big green bar at the bottom, has 180 days to review and approve each individual mitigation effort. Uh, whether it's sound, uh, uh, physical sound monitoring or sound insulation measures or, or the other ones that I'm going to uh, go through in a, in a second. Um, so our hope is by summer of next year, we'll have a fully approved noise compatibility program so we can immediately access federal funds. And here's, here's the... Uh, here's the uh, uh, proposed mitigation <coughs> efforts that we've outlined, uh, uh, not only with the FAA uh, as we continue our planning efforts with them, but also with our advisory committee and uh, uh, with the leadership of, of the uh, municipality surrounding the airport. Uh, sound insulation has been a very uh, um, positive uh, uh, measure to move forward. Uh, many of the local uh, municipalities have agreed to, that they definitely want to offer this this program. Um, sound insulation encompasses a uh, acoustical testing of that property. Uh, if they are within the federal threshold, uh, which is an interior noise level of 45 decibels, then they are d d average decibels. Then they would qualify for a sound insulation package, which generally consists of uh, new windows, new doors. Uh, if you think of uh, sound as also a uh, um, efficiency or energy efficiency item, your, your first weak points in the house could be the, the windows and the doors, and that's where uh, we would start with this so that it would be reduced to that federal threshold, which the FAA outlines and regulates down to the 45 dB DNL. Nick, how would I know if I qualify for the interior noise level? Again, do I have to have direct noise measurements? Or if I'm within the 65 um, dBA line contour, I'm, am I automatically eligible? Or do they, does somebody actually have to come and take a measurement in my home? Uh, uh, a little bit of both. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll use the Chamberlain Elementary School as, a, as an example. Uh, they are within the 65 dB DNL line of this new map and also the, the uh, previous version of the map, which was approved in 2015. That doesn't automatically make them eligible for sound insulation, but it brings it to the next step, which is that acoustical testing. Uh, we performed an acoustical test of the school. Uh, their interior noise levels were above that threshold. Uh, therefore, they did not qualify for a sound insulation package. Um, a little bit different, and we can get into the school a little bit later, with, with, with a residential house, we generally do a sample size based on, the, based on where you are in the actual contour line and what type of construction your house is. From that sample size, which the FAA is going to have to approve what that sample size is, uh, we would determine which houses would be part of that pilot program to do, the, to, to do the surveys. And if those surveys are completed in the houses that we survey do meet this threshold and are eligible for sound insulation, then all of the houses within that contour band would be eligible. Like our property appraisals. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, you said you said the noise in the school was above, but you meant below, right? It was quieter than 45? Correct. It was quieter than the 45. Right. It was not over the 45 decibel. So if I live in a house and I'm eligible for acoustical windows and doors, am I also eligible for air conditioning? Not necessarily, no. I mean, in the summertime, you need to open your windows. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, right, because this is an interior noise level reduction. Uh, the FAA has kind of shifted away from the air conditioning. Um, and I'm going to look at Diane Carter uh, now because she's more of a, a – and you, you can come up here too, Diane. Uh, Diane Carter is from the Jones Payne Group, uh, hired by the, by the airport. Uh, they're, they're one of the teams that are, are with the airport and have uh, done these programs all over the country, and that Diane would be able to answer that question much better than I. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, so if a home qualifies for sound insulation, then there would be some type of ventilation package if there is not currently central air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that in the region. Um, to provide that because the expectation is you're keeping your windows and doors closed mm -hmm. to block the noise out. And one other question, if it's, a, if it's a, um, a, re a renter in a home, but the owner of the house would have to participate. Apply and participate. Correct. Correct. And that's very similar to the school as well. Mm -hmm. So like I said, they did not qualify for the sound insulation. However, to keep their, your windows and doors closed, they did qualify for a positive ventilation. ventilation system, which is that HVAC air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the programs that we're working with the, the school district on now. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, how do, how do you handle, you know, how, how's maintenance of that? I mean, this package is great, but 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, the air conditioning may not be working so well. Maybe the windows are starting to get a little loose and rattly. Do you have anything? set up to help there or we don't the FAA does not pay for maintenance or upkeep of those items um, there's a very large discussion nationally about aging product the when the work is done you get a one-year warranty contractors warranty and the products themselves are warranted uh, the windows and doors 10 20 year warranties if the you know there's some failures but routine maintenance on an air conditioning system would be the responsibility of the homeowner. And, and as we did with the school, and it might not be as comprehensive with residential <laughs> properties, we, we performed a, a, an analysis of what could potentially be installed mm -hmm. and what the ongoing energy costs of that, that system could be, as well as the life of the system and, and some of those maintenance costs, so that the owner of the property, or in this case the school district, can make those decisions on what they want to move forward with uh, because it, the, the maintenance costs would not be eligible. Could you define or describe an aviation easement? It's a term with which I am unfamiliar. So an aviation easement, there are a variety of them, but it's basically, <coughs> uh, and the airport is for sound insulation is not recommending an aviation easement, so there will be no easement for sound insulation, but it is an agreement that the homeowner will give up their rights for the air space over their home. It can be for noise only, or you will see them for light, emissions, dust. We can have easements for obstructions. Um, but again, for the sound insulation, there, there, there is going to be no easement required. Okay, so that first bullet is not has changed. Correct, oh, yeah. yeah. And will the school be looked at again at the end of 2020 when uh, you have your F-35s and more fuller operation? I suspect the study, the acoustical study was done last year? I think it was done modeling F-35 as the noise source. Uh, yeah. Which is the only way the FAA really likes it. <coughs> is, is there more to, the, more to the potential land use measures in this slide? Yes. There is another slide? Yes. Ah, good, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I guess I, um, from having been on that TAC committee, I was the last time I was there, which I probably have missed a meeting, I did not think that the airport was interested in doing more purchase and demolition, but I'm seeing it here now. Is that a recent change? It's got added back in? That's a, that's a difficult one. So, so what we'll be recommending uh, in our NCP is any property within uh, or greater than the 75 DNO okay. so would still be... still within those 75. Right. Okay. Because these sound insulation packages, they are not eligible for those higher than... They're not effective, right. And the more important bullet point may be the last one, that, uh, you know, that you talk about building the hotels there in the uh, south end of the airport parking terminal. There you have both land uh, reuse and sound buffer in one package. It would seem to be the best value at the north end of the parking garage, not necessarily the south end, but 
And, and you're and you're right. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess I missed the context of that. So building new buildings is is a natural way of. Uh, well, there's been suggestions that you know the land has been zoned residential, yeah. and the homes were bought and demolished, and they cannot be used for residential again. And yet, the best buffer for sound is walls, oftentimes, right. which doesn't seem to be very attractive for the noise issue or for the people driving around the airport. It's a very lovely view. And, you know, all the folks in the neighborhood have asked for just make our streets skirt our neighborhood so we can have an intact neighborhood. I don't think they've been asking for walls uh, because they probably enjoy walking out there when right. the planes aren't flying and enjoying the view and everything that goes with it. But the uh, nature of a hotel can provide jobs Fair. within walking distance. It can provide uh, a sound buffer. Uh, yes, it might also block the view as much as a wall would, but it seems like it would be more economically attractive to create a commercial district along the airport perimeter uh, that would buffer the neighborhood. It would pull the street and traffic away uh, out of the neighborhood and then uh, also do the sound barrier thing and reuse the land. I love the way you're thinking. I, I we well, have that conversation with yeah, <laughs> always right <laughs> uh, with with uh, your colleagues in South Burlington as well. Uh, uh, one of the the third part of a Part 150 uh, study, which I haven't gone into, uh, I, I talk about it a little bit in that last bullet point. There uh, is a land reuse study. Uh, so we, we do that occasionally because we need to show the FA what we're doing with the land that we purchased with federal funds. Uh, in our latest land reuse, reuse study, it was a transportation mm -hmm. network uh, adjustment to those roads, realigning the roads, uh, creating more opportunity to build uh, buildings, uh, which would be that sound buffer, uh, and also creating green, sp green space that would remain a noise buffer between those two land uses airport land use and, and a residential land use. So that's, that's something we, we continue to, to advocate for and we do want to move forward with. Money is, a, is, is always a difficult part of this for, for any uh, part of it because we're not the jurisdiction uh, that mm -hmm. controls the, the, the transportation network there. When you, when you say federal funds, you're talking about trust fund revenues, which are mainly financed by users of the system. You got it, yep, absolutely. The super fund, which, which, yeah, as you fly, you'll get taxed, and, and those go into the, the FAA funds. Yeah. Uh, uh, we talked a little about land acquisition, sound buffers and barriers. Uh, uh, we've ha heard from the, the neighbors, uh, or rather the communities, that this may be a potential. Uh, but I, I kept it in here because I wanted to talk about how uh, it, it's not necessarily as impactful and effective uh, to the residents behind there. You're talking about the sound buffer? Sound buffer, yeah, the sound buffer or a barrier or, or a wall. <coughs> uh, obviously, anything in height next to an airport is not necessarily compatible to what, we, what, we, uh, what our mission is. Um, uh, and it's, it doesn't uh, uh, effectively remove that, that or mitigate that noise. It may help with ground level noise, uh, but as you know, aircraft don't always stay on the ground. Uh, so so it, it's not going to be the most impactful mitigation effort as part of this program. Uh, further, if we were to move forward with a, a, a barrier of some sort, the folks on the other side of the barrier potentially could, could, won't be eligible for any other option uh, that we're proposing here. And we want to make sure, and the FAA has told us time and time again, that this really is the homeowner's decision on what they choose. So we don't want to create something that eliminates a homeowner or multiple homeowners uh, from being eligible for other scenarios. These are going to be our new ones uh, that, that you may have heard of but, but get uh, somewhat more uh, complicated. Um, sales assistance, we're, we're going to keep into the uh, recommendations. Uh, however, we've heard uh, from leadership from the municipalities it, that it's not as favorable versus the purchase assurance. Uh, real quick, sales assistance is, is just that. The homeowner or the property owner would put their house or property on the open market. The airport would do a fair market value appraisal and the homeowner is guaranteed that fair market, of, uh, uh, fair market value of the house. Uh, there's, there's no sound insulation package put into the house. It's just a guarantee that the 
homeowner walks away with that fair market value. Uh, this one does require an Correct. abrogation easement as well, uh, in exchange for the, for the difference in in fair market value and, and the uh, 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 the sale of the house. Purchase assurance is a little bit different. So again, we do a fair market value appraisal of the house. The property owner sells that house directly to the airport. We we buy the house. We sound to insulate the house, and then we put the house back on the open market. Uh, uh, navigation. Yes. This one also requires a navigation easement in exchange for that process. Uh, again, similar in, in the way that the homeowner uh, will walk away with a fair market value uh, uh, um, sale of the house. Uh, the difference is there's some investment into the, the housing stock with the purchase assurance with sound insulation uh, for that property for the next uh, buyer. Any questions on, on those two? Those, those are definitely unique uh, to us. This is the first time we've ever uh, proposed these uh, two particular um, noise measures. Uh, pretty unique in the New England region as well. Uh, uh, so so it, it's, uh, again, we've been working with the FA for many, many years now on, on starting to offer these programs. And uh, we're going to continue to propose these and, and look for feedback as we go to public uh, comment and uh, uh, we look at these very favorably to be offered again just m more tools in the tool bag so to speak uh, for a homeowner to, to choose something that best fits uh, their situation uh, easement acquisition is is also on on the, the chart there uh, that's a simple exchange for an easement uh, uh, and, and in exchange for cash that's something we're not going to be recommending uh, it's, it's uh, of course, a very simple transaction, uh, but again, it doesn't invest into the community or that housing stock. Um, so uh, we've heard from, from uh, leadership around the area that that's something that just doesn't fit into what we're trying to produce, uh, uh, but uh, I wanted to present that to you just uh, as one of the measures that we've talked about in our advisory committee. I think there was a, Regine, did you have a question? <clears throat> understands that these noise levels are high and they're choosing to buy the house anyway so there's no actual like abatement of the noise in the home correct okay which is why we're, we're not in favor of that as well as as the other municipalities there's there's no sound insulation that goes into the house it, it may also be the case that a homeowner for some reason needs to sell there's been a relocation or something <coughs> And the house has been acoustically tested, and it wouldn't be eligible for sound insulation. So we wouldn't be able to put any treatments in it. So it's all, we, are, we know it's already considered compatible from an interior noise level. And the final one there on the list is a real estate disclosure. Well, we, we could, we'll continue to work with the Northwestern Real Estate Board, I believe. Uh, they do have a real estate disclosure now uh, uh, within, the, within the entire uh, environmental impact statement, uh, which was produced by the, um, uh, by the Air National Guard a few years ago. And uh, we'll continue to work with them on, on making sure that that still uh, is, is disclosed through the area. Which I can get any of you a copy if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say it right? Northwestern Real Estate? North, Northern Vermont Board of Realtors and VBR. Uh, so that that's really it. Um, uh, this is uh, our noise exposure map. Let me start with a, a simpler one. Uh, this is our future forecast of our noise exposure map, or what we call the 2023 future conditions. Uh, there's three contour bands on that map. You have your inner contour band right here, which is the 75 average decibel level, your 70 contour, and then the outer band is the uh, 65. We are somewhere over here right now for, for context. Uh, and actually, here we go. <coughs> I haven't trouble seeing it, but yeah, somewhere over here. West Canal. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, uh, obviously a, a zoomed in picture of the Winooski area. This is all on our website too, so you can 
uh, dive into it. Uh, there's also an interactive map on our website, btvsound.com, that you can enter individual addresses in, and it'll pop up a, uh, a little pin on the address so you can see exactly where you are on the contour, uh, within the contour area. Uh, this is a, a few contour lines on there, and I, I, I just wanted to show you some historical perspective as well as uh, a few different noise uh, maps that were produced over the years. I'll start with this outside black line. This is the 2013 published map that the Air National Guard produced uh, as part of their environmental impact statement. This red line is what we just looked at, which is our 2023 future forecast. Uh, which is uh, which does have the full uh, uh, F-35 uh, deployment in here as well as uh, of course all aircraft at the airport. This blue contour line is what we call our existing conditions map. Uh, again, this was produced uh, during, uh, uh, in fact, the latter half of the drawdown of the F-16 operations. So this was not all F-16s operating at the airport. However, this orange map, which was published in 2015, is our no, was our existing condition map at the time in 2015, and that does show all uh, 18 F-16s operating at the airport. That was a 65 decibel level? That those, the, all of those are the 65 decibel. And uh, here, <coughs> sorry, I'm going real fast here. here. Here's the same map, just zoomed in on the South Burlington side. Uh, this is the west side of the airport. This blue square is the Chamberlain Elementary School with Williston Road coming in here, Airport Drive, White Street, Airport Parkway. Uh, all 65 DNL lines. Orange line is all F-16s operating. This red line is with all F-35s operating. And the blue line is the old one and, and I see a lot of those gray little parcels. Those are all properties that you acquire that are now owned by the airport. Yep, the, the blue line is, is actually our existing condition line. And yes, anything colored in this uh, large gray color in here is uh, property owned by the, by the uh, Burlington Airport. And those were acquired as part of the old programs uh, over the last uh, uh, few decades. Of an impact into South Burlington Correct. with all the F-16s than it will be with the F-35s? Correct. So uh, this red line is the 2023 F-35, if you will, contour line. This was the F-16 line, so it did decrease in the city of South Burlington on both sides. Again, how much of the data reflects their normal military power versus the uh, afterburner power when the facts are that it's going to change. It changed for the F-16. Uh, the historical data we have already for the F-35 says it's going to be taking off at a louder rate than it is being promised to us at. And I'm sure all the data that's reflected in there goes, oh, 5% uh, afterburner, 95% military power. That's exactly what it does, yep. And that's not going to be the case. Uh, uh, we've we've received confirmation from the DOD as well as the Air National Guard that that is the case. Um, of course, if it Andy changes, <laughs> I, I, I yeah I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Obviously, the F-16 map has changed over time, and and the map will change over time based on certain type of aircraft coming into the airport. If that happens, <coughs> a new noise exposure map will will be produced. Well, yeah, you know, to to be fair and honest, to the community and everybody involved, I think the monitoring. I described before, and South Burlington's asked for, and I'm sure Winooski and uh, you know Williston, if they haven't asked for it before, will be asking for it soon, because they're going to be more directly affected uh, with the overflying on, on their territory. Ours is lateral, um, is going to be a way to you know make sure that things stay current. Uh, we don't have to wait till 2021 to find out. Oh my God. I must have missed something uh, because it's, to my experience, it's kind of common knowledge that the F-35s are louder than the F-16s. Can you explain why, when you shift from F-16s to F-35s, the envelope of, the, of that decibel level shrinks? I, I don't I, understand how that could happen. Uh, again, just on the east and west side. So yeah, note, that, yeah. note that it really extends, you know, lengthwise significantly. 
So this orange line is all F-16 operating. This red line is all F-35s operating. They must be so fast, they're not staying on the runway. <laughs> and, and if you think of this, uh, think of this as a 3D model, if, if you will, and when an aircraft departs, uh, using an F-16, for example, using significant afterburner use, they were departing fast and departing at a much higher elevation at this point at the airfield uh, than where the F-35 is not going to be using the afterburners as much and departing elongated in the airport. So at the same point over, over in this area, F-16 was much higher. F-35 will, will be more like a commercial. Carly Davidson versus Kawasaki. <laughs> there you go. And I ask, seeing this map and seeing the the really new contours and impacts in Williston and Winooski in particular, the uh, it makes me wonder now about um, what the noise compatibility program not including anything for new developments in those areas in terms of. Well, I guess maybe it's just seller disclosure, but nothing uh, for them to mitigate when they're developing. Yeah, and that's something we've we've discussed with with uh, the municipalities on on putting into their their zoning or building codes if if uh, uh, if if they have any, and um, and that's something we'll continue yeah. to do as well. We'd like to see the jurisdictions put in something into their their development codes that would require some type of uh, acoustical package when they're building new structures to make sure that those homes are, are as uh, quiet as they can be. The FAA has a policy that it will not fund the mitigation of homes that were built if the home was built inside of a noise contour. So if there was an apartment complex built and and when so it was built it was in the contour issue, it's yeah. yeah. But can you go back to how you characterize that real estate <coughs> piece and the NCP? Um, oh the real estate disclosure. Yeah, the uh, ease of acquisition for new development. So you're not you said you're not gonna get the bottom left here. Correct. You're not gonna get an easement on new development, but you are asking the the local jurisdiction to put in some requirements property owner needs to have eyes wide open. Uh, I mean, and I'm not so worried about single family homes, but I mean, we're certainly getting yeah. a lot of apartment buildings and mm -hmm. condo development, particularly in Winooski. Uh, I don't know, in Williston, there's, there is some single family neighborhoods, but it's not, I don't know that there's much redevelopment happening there. Okay. I have a question. Go ahead. I was gonna, I mean, we're, uh, this goes to energy efficiency. I, I was just curious, does, uh, you know, since for new development we're asking for higher levels of energy efficiency, is that going to help those buildings as well uh, for, you know, the, the sound as well as? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, including the, the sound <coughs> insulation program as well. So not only on new development uh, that is built after the, the, the maps here, um, uh, being eligible for any one of the uh, ener uh, energy efficiency programs. But as we move forward with sound insulation or, or the combination of the, the other programs that we talked about, we're also discussing that with Vermont Gas and Efficiency Vermont, making sure we kind of package things together or work with them. So as we per, uh, perform some work in these residential houses, potentially there's some programs that they could start offering at the same time. Because you're right, this is, this is uh, while the intent and the, the, the FAA's intent is, of course, not to create an, an energy-efficient house, but rather mm -hmm. reduce the interior noise levels, it's, it's, it's very, very close uh, together that you, we really can combine those efforts. Yeah, because I mean, with the modern heat pump, you know, the, you get heating and cooling and exactly. Yeah. No, great thought. Anything else for Nick? Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, Nick came to the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee a couple of weeks ago and essentially did the same presentation. One of the things that you talked about, you haven't got to hear, that I think was of interest to them, was um, how are you going to prioritize the homes that will get the sound mitigation? There's lots of homes in that zone, there's only so much money. 
how we go about deciding who gets the money first, second, third? Uh, yeah, great question, Peter. Um, Again, it's it's not going to be entirely, this is a small fine print, I guess you can say. It's not going to be entirely up to us on how we prioritize as it, as it is regulated by the FAA. However, uh, there's been discussion that, that uh, many of the uh, uh, low income or multifamily houses, uh, potentially in the Winooski area or, or other areas, may potentially <coughs> a higher priority. Uh, the, the reason I started with the, the small fine print in, in there is because generally the FAA wants to see us, the airport, working as close to the airport in proximity and then slowly working our way out, uh, especially if noise contours change in the future, which, which they will and they do, and, and we've all seen them uh, change. Uh, so so it, it, in our next step is, is really to produce an implementation plan which is really going to define uh, and, and bring at the FAA more into the conversation on how we can prioritize uh, higher density areas, which may include the, the uh, lower income as well, into a, a higher prioritization. Again, it, it, it's something that we still need to uh, plan for and, and write the documentation for and, and of course receive federal approval before we, we can move that forward. Need to be crass, a couple money questions. Um, when, in the last cycle, when as you were doing property acquisition and the demolitions, um, I assume you had to apply to FAA for grant money. I assume there's probably a local match. How much, what's a percent match? 10%. Uh, 10%. Yeah. And was that uh, entirely funded by the airport in the city of Burlington? Previously, yeah, previously, it, it was. It, so as we as we invested in these uh, uh, acquisitions of this area, we did support that with with a ten percent match. Uh, we still, again, in the implementation plan, but we don't have these programs approved yet. So as we right. have the, the further discussions, we will have have to discuss uh, with municipalities on on where that ten percent local match uh, will come from. Um, how, so it's not characterizing noise, and, and then help me with sequencing for applying for FAA grant money. Um, if you approve this plan, you send it to the FAA at the end of the calendar year, let's say they approve it in January, can you apply for funds right after that? We can. We can. We can, we can apply for funds at any time in the federal uh, fiscal year. Um, uh, okay. But I guess I was really asking, you kind of mentioned uh, doing an implementation plan is do you like submit your implementation plan is the funding request almost we don't technically have to have an approved implementation plan know. but no. this is something that we we really need because this is a this is a big project uh so so we've asked the faa to to help us move that forward to really define uh, uh, how to implement this and what the prioritization is and how homeowners can get involved and where they can communicate to us and, and our consultants uh we're we're really hoping that concurrently with the FAA's review, uh, that 180 day time frame, that will also have an implementation plan uh, to, to publish. Uh, and start applying for funding. And then to start applying for funding immediately after we get that approval. Yeah, I'm anticipating that conversation with the neighbor municipalities about who's providing maps to be. I don't know how productive that'll be, but <laughs> interesting anyway. <It'll> interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, challenging maybe? Um, yeah, because I think, uh, yeah, that's that's a hard one for municipalities to feel like they contribute to something that isn't, they didn't make the impact. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's going to be a hard challenge. But it, it, I, I agree. It's it's going to be a difficult uh, conversation uh, across the board and um, for us as well, because we want to do everything that we financially can uh, help with as well. Um, uh, it, this this is a very big program, and, and it's going to take many years uh, to fully implement. Um, and, and I think that's really where that, those planning efforts and, and those those conversations uh, need to be had, uh, not only on the, the physical implementation, but also the, the financial part of it as well, uh, so we can continue to be to be successful. Okay. Anything else? It's not. Thank you, Nick. Thank Appreciate you very much. I, I'm with Diane. Yes. Please feel free to Thank follow you. up with Diane yes. or myself <laughs> if, if uh, you have any questions. Thank you for the invite.
Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, let's move on to nothing to see here. <laughs> nothing to see here. Right? Yeah. How are you doing? Good. You want to join us at the table? Sure. Transition here. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Charlie. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Did I ask too many questions? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just I was watching the news today yeah. that coming over that was just a jaw dropping moment. As honest as I can be. Okay, we're going to move on to the next is agenda that, item: is that Green Mountain can... Transit Asset Management Plan and Targets. John. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. So, um, want to talk a little bit tonight about our transit asset management plan. This is a uh, federal transit administration uh, requirement uh, for all transit properties to produce. Um, our board adopted this back uh, November of 18. Uh, there's also a requirement for the uh, MPO to adopt. Um, our measures or create their own. So this is an action item that uh, we'll, we'll speak about after or Peter will. Um, so I just want to give a quick overview of what the plan is and some of the requirements. Um, so essentially a transit asset management plan is uh, a, a plan and a, really a program uh, to maximize the utilization out of public transit um, assets. So it's a strategic and systematic practice of uh, buying, operating, uh, maintaining and replacing capital assets. So it looks at the complete life cycle um, of, of our assets um, and then it really supports the managing of the performance of those assets uh, minimizing the risks and then um, trying to be as uh, cost efficient over the life cycle of that asset um, with the overall goal of providing safe cost effective and reliable um, public transit services um, in our area so there's a lot of benefits um, that an asset management plan um, can create. It's essentially working smarter and trying to, like I said, uh, maximize uh, investment in our capital assets. Uh, can reduce risk and improve safety um, by reducing injuries. Um, support more effective operations uh, in, in a couple of different ways, but um, from a funding standpoint and a spending standpoint, um, it's always cheaper to be proactive and try to uh, predict um, uh, issues uh, opposed to being reactive and having downtime on, on buses and, and other vehicles. Uh, improve reliability and customer service uh, so we can minimize our on-road maintenance issues uh, a much higher on-time performance and reliability um, standard can also improve the uh, the passenger experience by having cleaner uh, more presentable vehicles and, and bus stations and bus stops um, and then also uh, can save time money and resources um, optimizing return on investment um, and then again, reducing the cost uh, over the, the life cycle of the asset uh, with some proactive um, uh, management measures. So there is a list of uh, requirements uh, in the plan. Um, these are all fairly new requirements. Um, so we're uh, continually looking at our plan and program. This is the first year that we're kind of reporting to the FTA on the progress of our plan. Um, and then we will also look at, um, you know, redeveloping goals and uh, measures as we uh, move along. Um, so the first uh, requirement obviously was to create the plan um, and then going forward, we'll have to maintain and update it. The FTA wants to see an update, um, generally speaking, every four years, but um, it certainly can be done, um, you know, sooner than that, depending on the situation. Knowing that this is a new plan for us, we'll look uh, this fiscal year at updating it uh, with some of the goals and, and, and the measures. Um, there's a coordination requirement with VTRANS um, and then the regional planning agencies. So we've worked with VTRANS on this. Um, and then, of course, we're here tonight for the MPO um, discussion. Uh, there's a self-certification requirement um, during our grant making uh, process, uh, which uh, we've done. Um, and then there's some annual reporting through the National Transit Database, which is an FTA program. So uh, we submit the annual data report, um, including our targets, um, how we kind of measured up uh, to those targets, and then also an ongoing um, update of our inventories, our fleet inventories and equipment inventories, and the, um, the, the condition assessments at the time of the report. Um, we also have to submit a, an annual narrative report in addition to some of those um, measurements to the NTD. And then 
also participate in oversight uh, during the triennial review, uh, which uh, GMT is subject to every three years from the FTA, and then a state management review for our rural properties, uh, which is uh, conducted through VTRAN. So that's kind of the auditing um, aspect of, of the plan in, in the program. So in terms of the targets, um, the FTA kind of defines what the targets are, and then we um, develop the measurements to uh, see how we're doing. So for rolling stock at uh, GMT, just buses, um, the target is the age of the, of the vehicle. Uh, same for the equipment, which is maintenance and non-revenue vehicles. And then for the facilities, there's a condition rating. Um, it's called the term scale. Um, and that's both for support um, facilities for maintenance and administration, and then passenger facilities like our downtown transit center. Those are all um, applicable to these scoring uh, measures. So in terms of the performance measures, um, the targets are kind of identified. We have to create the measures. Uh, so that top um, graphic, uh, hard to read, but kind of shows that process. So essentially, uh, for our uh, rolling stock uh, revenue vehicles, our buses, and for our non-revenue vehicles and our uh, maintenance equipment, uh, we've selected uh, the measure of being the per percentage of vehicles that have reached their uh, ULB, which is their useful life uh, benchmark essentially their uh, useful life uh, cycle. Uh, we've selected years as the kind of indicator of that. Uh, for our revenue vehicles, um, there is some uh, leeway that the FTA grants of the local uh, jurisdiction kind of selects what the useful uh, life uh, benchmark is. We've initially used 12, um, and the reason for that is the FTA, uh, if you're using federal dollars to purchase a full-size transit bus, you have to keep it for a minimum of 12 years. Um, part of the goal with this is that we can extend that useful uh, life benchmark to 13 or 14 years to try to, um, again, do more with, with less funding. Um, the biggest consideration in terms of extending that in our climate, in our climate is the, uh, the body of, of the vehicles. Um, we typically do a midlife overhaul in the engines to extend the, the mechanical side of it, but once the body starts to corrode, uh, it's, it's, it's cost prohibitive in a lot of times to extend the life of that vehicle. So, Using 12 to start, but that may be extended hopefully in the future, um, partially based on the um, efficiency of this plan. Uh, and then in terms of how we're doing, um, so for our rolling stock, uh, thankfully uh, we had a fairly large influx of new buses in the last uh, 18 months. So only 7% of our 66 uh, uh, Burlington-based uh, bus fleet uh, is over that 12-year mark, uh, which is well under our goal of 20%. Um, out of our non-revenue vehicles and our maintenance equipment, 77% are actually over that useful uh, life benchmark. Um, again, we are looking at adjusting some of those um, life cycle um, time frames, so that would bring that number down. But again, the, the purpose of this plan is to uh, also prioritize investment, so this certainly speaks that we need to prioritize some investment in some of our uh, non-revenue vehicles. Uh, the other piece of it is uh, rating our facilities. Um, so we have three main um, facilities in uh, Chittenden County, our main admin um, and maintenance facility um, on Queen City Park Road in Burlington, a uh, storage facility right next door, and then our downtown transit center. Um, our goal is to have all facilities at a 3.0 uh, condition or better. Um, as you can see from the three existing facilities, our storage building, uh, is under that. Um, so again, that is an area that we've already programmed into our capital budget to prioritize some investment in getting that building up to, um, up to, up to uh, scale, I guess, in terms of where we want it. Question. So you're going to put these benchmarks together and the FTA is, you're going to submit it to the FTA. Is there some sort of audit process from them to sort of hold you to your benchmarks? And the reason I bring that up is, you know, typical management, what you're looking at here is you've got a public-facing end, which is the buses people ride on. You've got a back-facing end, which is your own vehicles for maintenance and whatever. And it's very typical that, you know, the people in charge are going to want to put the, the money on the out-facing, not the in-facing, and the in-facing always lags behind. I mean, it's, it's you, other, I mean, it's, it's kind of universal how that works. Is this an effort on the part of the FTA to sort of evolve that so more money gets spent outside of that and how is that really going to affect how you do business right um so that's a great question uh we had a triennial review last year so we won't have another one for two years so um the auditing will be through that triennial review what the ramifications will be of not meeting our own set internal goals i guess is unknown at this point 
Um, but we're certainly going to want to use this as a management tool to try to even um, maintenance equipment and support vehicles. Uh, if they're not uh, up to the proper condition, it's going to cost you more over the life cycle. Yeah, I, I understand that. that. The other part is that I know with some of the new rules and regs in the, in the transportation bills in general, they're wanting all of these new measurements. And then they're, the thought is they're going to put hammers behind it. Um, so I'm wondering if you're hearing that with this too, or if that's sort of not creeped into your business yet. Yeah, I, I, I guess we haven't heard what those hammers are yet. I'm sure there will be some of those uh, involved. Again, this is a fairly new program to the FTA, so I think it's still evolving. Okay. Um, but I'm sure at some point, um, and some of that may be a lack of funding. They may say, you know, you're not eligible for certain grant programs if you're not keeping your existing fleet up to, uh, up to standards. So. There's still some unknown, I guess, in our end from the FTA, but I'm sure that will be hashed out, uh, especially in our next triennial review. Okay, thank you. Yep. Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. John. Maybe you're being too hard on yourself and putting your <coughs> back room equipment on the same 20% standard that you're putting your revenue generating fleet on. So maybe it's a problem with how you've established the standard. Yeah. It, rather it, than anything, because I'm not going to, I don't, I wouldn't want you to come to my town select board and say, you have all, all this additional requirements to get back end machinery, replace it all at once, and then just have a problem 10 to 12 years down the road where you got to replace it again. Right, yeah. So I'd much rather have you take it out consistently and maybe set up a sinking fund where a certain number of material, of, of pieces of equipment are replaced every year for your back end, you know. Uh, stuff rather than your revenue generating thing because I think you're putting the emphasis on the right thing, which right. is the revenue generating thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and it goes hand in hand. Yeah, mm -hmm. not necessarily you know coming to the communities and saying we've got all this extra cost, so we have to come for more support just for the back end part of your operation. Not that the back end part of the operation isn't important. It's just that I would advocate you if that if it's truly that doing it more systematically and right. being honest with yourself and taking those vehicles out occasionally and, and have a levelized system for it rather than having to replace 80% of it at some point in time, two or three years out, right. and you create another lump that yeah. people got to swallow later. Yeah, yeah, especially if you get to, ch to choose what your benchmarks are. Yeah. I mean, obviously this, these plans are, are elastic in the fact that you update them from time to time. You can always move the benchmarks. But you know, understanding that the feds tend to want to have hammers now. Uh, you know, you want to don't put yourself in a place where you're going to get. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, so that that 77 percent of the um, non-revenue and in, in, um, support equipment is artificially at, out of whack. For example, um, the FTA says any non-revenue vehicle, you know, a pickup truck or a Prius for non-revenue, has a four-year useful life benchmark. That's what we're using. What we will do is switch out to a mileage uh, so base. So that should be 90%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so we have some, for example, our service trucks might be a 2011, 2012. They might have 14,000. They're driving around our yard. So um, to use a four-year useful life benchmark is not accurate. Like I said, accurate. don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah, right. exactly. So, so that's, unless there's other questions, that's what I have uh, for tonight. And I'll we'll turn it over to Peter or Charlie for sure. the. Um, as John mentioned earlier, um, there is some NPO action required related to this. So I want to give a little bit more background on that. And before I start, though, by the way, the, the transit asset management plan that you approved a year ago, you, you gave a synopsis of it, but there's a lot of information there. Detailed inventory information, as well as priority investments you're going forward and what you're investing in when. So he just kind of gave a, you know, a nice review. Um, if you recall, about a year ago, this board considered a bunch of, of transportation performance targets that came from B-Trans, um, related to safety and congestion. And according to the federal regulations, um, you know, the, the, the state agency created these targets in consultation with other parties, and the MPO could develop their own or agree to B-Trans. And this board decided to agree with what B-Trans had done, for probably very good reasons. Now we're in a similar position with public transportation. They've developed a transit asset management plan to say, and they've developed targets. They have a very, actually, uh, a very broad statement. It's in the memo, by the way, it's highlighted, uh, related to the useful life benchmark of their facilities and the term uh, uh, the determination on their facilities. The other thing is for their rolling stock and, and, um, and, uh, and other um, assets. 
Um, if you look at this, the, uh, the, the um, memo in your packet, um, it gives a lot of that background. It also gives definitions of those acronyms that John talked about, like state of good repair, useful life benchmark, things like that. Um, lots of acronyms uh, used here. Uh, but what we're looking for you tonight is to agree with the performance targets that they set in their asset management plan, to take action on that, and to move on. Um, that's only one step in this process that I want to point out. You have to come back within a year with a transit safety plan. July 1st, yeah. Uh, and, and we'll be asked as well to agree to targets for the transit sure, safety. Sure, we approve the targets as presented uh, by GMT uh, as set forth in November 2019. Second. Okay. Okay, motion by Jeff, second by Andy. Anything else you want to add, Peter? That's it. That's it. Any discussion, comments from the board? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank motion you. carries. And that was in. Right, thank you. Thank you. That wasn't a way to vote, was it? It was, yeah, that's an MPO. Yeah, you did not hear me. What's that? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I heard four from Andy. So. Yeah. Andy has to go if you're going to vote for the Essex alternate, you have to go I I. But he's here tonight, so I'm going right. to do that. So just, just, for the, to correct the minutes. just for the couple new members that may not be familiar, for when we have an MPO vote, um, those are weighted votes. Burlington gets, Andy gets four, four. votes. Um, yeah, Colchester, Colchester and South Burlington each get two. And, well, and the Essex is, two, one the Essex one get two. <laughs> Um, we normally do a roll call unless it's unanimous. Yeah, right? unless, yeah. and if it's not unanimous, we would do a roll call. But um, We've been voting on something like the CERC for a long time, so there's been no no's. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no's. Okay. <laughs> Next, we'll move on to the 2000. Actually, it's a plus V trains. That's right. To continue the. I was trying to get to your Essex Junction uh, plan, and I'm, you're interrupting. Just, for the benefit <laughs> of the new members <laughs> who didn't attend the board. Orientation. orientation. Yeah, yeah. And the old members too. So the next item is a 2019 Village of Essex Junction Comprehensive Plan and Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan approval. Who's doing that? Emily. Emily. Well, let's let Emily right. go ahead and talk first. <laughs> and then I'll <laughs> come more. Cool. Yeah. I have questions. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, that's all right. Let's let Emily give her Spiel. I'll give a very brief summary. So there are two documents that we're looking at here. One of them is the 2019 Village of Essex Junction Comprehensive Plan. Uh, this is a an update that was recently completed by Melanie Needle in our office in collaboration uh, with planning staff and planning commission in Essex Junction. And it has as a companion document the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan. Uh, because Essex and Essex Junction have a shared energy committee. They've created this shared energy plan together. Um, it was adopted as part of the comprehensive plan by the village when they adopted their Essex Junction plan. Um, but Essex Town has not been interested in amending their plan at this point. So the select board has simply approved the plan as um, sort of a gesture to show that it's an appropriate work plan for their shared energy committee um, until such time as they amend their plan and adopt it as part of that document. Um, you can see the memo that I've included in this that shows um, that we didn't have any concerns about uh, any part of the plan and the planning advisory committee has recommended approval, conservation, and energy compliance <coughs> uh, That's also the staff recommendation. Okay, thank you. Dan, would you like to make a motion? I move the approval of the plan. Okay. I'll second it. Second by Jeff. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair, yes. Um, I, I, just because I'm, I'm here and our chair of our select board happens to be here, I can't resist. Um, for a long time, I've always been hopeful that when the village the town, the village, which is a part of the town's plan is approved, that it would be automatically joined to the town outside the village plan so that we would have a unified community plan, kind of similar to the way that we approve the TIP, it becomes part of the state transportation improvement plan. Our, when we approve our TIP, it automatically becomes part of the state transportation improvement plan. 
And so I've said this many times before, I don't know why our staff doesn't do it in our happy community, but I'm hopeful that in the interest of coordinated good planning, that at some point in time, we will have a unified town of Essex plan with a village district that gets automatically incorporated into the town and you can join the plan. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll leave that one right where it is. Like Corey Lewandowski, I was talking to an audience of one there. we're well on our way to get into Okay, next item is the FY 2020 committee appointments. Um, there are a couple of changes from what you had in your packet. Uh, UPWP committee, uh, Jackie Murphy is going to take the seat that was, I think it was Jeff. It was Jeff's. It was Jeff's. 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 So Jackie's agreed to that. Um, TAC interest group reps, we have Seth Bowden who's going to do the business side. Uh, the PAC committee, planning advisory committee, um, Wayne Howe, the alternate from Jericho, get that right, mm -hmm. has agreed to um, take that position. Josh Bessie is is uh, stepping down. Well, and he'll remain on the committee because he's yeah. Bolton's oh, okay. rep to the pack, but he was <clears throat> okay. kind of filling a little dual role, but uh, happy to, I think, have Wayne <laughs> add to the group. Uh, let me see. So that leaves us, uh, Board Development Committee has an open spot. It doesn't need it up to four members we have three members on there so if anyone is interested in that let me know um, I'll volunteer for the back double here. okay you're on it. You're already on it. No, no, no. No, no, Vapta. Oh, alternate for alternate for Andy. No, I thought I heard the word Vapta. No, Vapta. Down at the bottom down at the bottom. Okay. So that takes care of that one. So um, with those, Tom, Tom, what did you want to volunteer for? Uh, the clean water. Oh, clean water. We've got one. Is that a standing committee or is that a select hot? Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's a, oh, that's a right. committee in our bylaws where we have one board member, but yeah. maybe we could have an alternate where if you mm -hmm. can't show, Tom could go. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Well, actually, so, it also makes sense that agriculture would be part of clean yeah. water anyway. You know, just as, a, a, as a, yeah. a, a thing. So we'll make that new alternate. Got it. Okay. I'll tell him. So those are the uh, appointments, and we need just consensus from this board. Is that right? Or I think you said the last. Yeah. Huh? Sense of the board. Sense of the board. Anyone have a problem with it? All right, we'll move on then. Okay. Uh, next is chair executive directors updates. Chair has nothing. <laughs> I feel all these down here for you. Just, just, a, just as the previous chair never had anything, I have nothing. <laughs> um, I, I, um, so I'm, I'm between you and leaving. Um, so I'll try to go pretty quickly. Um, you may have seen a little bit of press on the building homes together update. Uh, you were basically on target in terms of housing production of uh, building 700 units a year, the last three years uh, in Cheney County. However, mm -hmm. we're below target for the affordable units. We're trying to get to 20% of them being affordable. And I think we're a little bit more than halfway. Sorry, I'm looking at Regina. Maybe. Yeah, the average has been more like 13%. Right? Yeah, okay. So two thirds. So. Um, so um, that's just a quick update, yeah. Um, and you know, I think just looking forward, um, there there are a lot of big projects that are kind of in construction. You know, we'll be hitting 18 or I'm sorry, 19 and 20. Um, so we'll see how close we get uh, to building 3,500 new homes in five years. Um, the transportation climate initiative. You may have seen a little bit about this. Uh, there's a a, a regional uh, northeast conversation going on, I think, with states from Virginia to Maine, uh, a little bit similar to the regional greenhouse gas initiative and the, the cap and trading system that they put into place there. They're looking to see if they can develop a system similar focused on transportation. Um, if they can get together and develop a market, uh, at least the, the uh, 
this is kind of a combined effort of A and R and VTrans uh, participating in that effort. You know, with the other states, um, they're saying maybe you know twenty-five to fifty million dollars may be raised through that to invest in shifting transportation, you know, fuel usage, and and maybe even uh, mode usage. So um, that could be very interesting, and we're uh, we're facilitating a little workshop uh, in the next week or two. Um, to try to get some input to VTrans and ANR to help with that. So that's just a little FYI for you. Um, Amtrak storage study. Um, we uh, completed a report over the summer. It's been very popular for uh, people to read. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, and I just left the Rail Council this afternoon, which um, I have a seat on the State Rail Council. Uh, at which this was the entire like two hour topic of discussion um, and just for you all as board members of CCRPC because you're going if you haven't already seen our name bandied about in various different ways with various characterizations <coughs> to CCRPC and our work um, so a couple of things I'll give you one is uh, there's frustration with um, you know what scored highest um, and if you look at the report, and I think we were careful working with VHB to try to say, like, we were just trying to give some relative assessments of different criteria, but the criteria are not weighted in the report. So they're all basically equalized. Everything was scored on a three-point scale. So if it was a high impact on noise, it got three. If it was a low impact on noise, maybe it got one. Um, and, and every criteria was kind of just, it was you know, zero, one, two, three. Um, and so at the end of it, things kind of evened out, um, but, uh, and the way I've been talking about it is, listen, we're providing a technical analysis for use by the decision makers. The decision makers need to put values to those different criteria. If they decide, you know, uh, air pollution or noise is way more important than, you know, visual or uh, cost or something else, that's, you know, that's how they make decisions, right? Like, um, and so um, I just want you to know, like, we did not make a decision about what was the best site. We just produced a report with criteria, with scoring to help the decision-making process. So um, to my Tyler, understanding, yes, sir. Is there a way to get that information out, what you're saying to us, get it out so it's People we'll understand that better. Try to push that at the appropriate time. There's still some more flack coming. Okay. And then, when I feel like all the flack is bundled up, we'll try to okay. put a correcting, okay. clarifying picture out there. I think that's going to, as you're alluding to, I think I think that's going to be really important to do because yeah. I, I think one of the biggest concerns that, that I've seen out there about this is a lot of people who are really supportive of Amtrak coming yeah. are looking at you know, the water, Burlington's waterfront and saying, well, if that's what it takes, then maybe I'm not so interested. And that would be a real shame if that's what happened. So I think mm -hmm. the sooner we could get, you know, ahead of that and, and let people know, no, that's you know, just what you're saying. You know, this is just looking at each of the different things on an unweighted, and the next level is to do the weighted yeah. and to really come up with, I think that's gonna be really important because it's not pretty out there from this report, <laughs> from what I've heard from many people. Welcome, the water's warm. Um, come on in. Uh, but the, uh, I just, I guess I'll go another layer deeper. Uh, we've been getting uh, a lot of FOIA requests from one particular party, um, you know, really around Main Street Landing and what happens around Union Station. Um, and this morning, at, or yeah, this afternoon at the Rail Council, I also got a statement from that party uh, that includes their their analysis of what they saw in reading all the records. You know, you know, so they got emails and drafts and you know, iterations of drafts. Uh, <coughs> and there's there's some allegations that they're making that um, that we will have to stand up to correct at some point. So um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll be working on that over the next okay. month or two. Uh, at this point, the Rail Council was asked by Secretary Flynn to make a recommendation at their, I think that we're gonna have a meeting December 3rd or 4th, the first week of December, I can't remember the date right now, um, 
And so Secretary Flynn, that will be a recommendation from the Rail Council to Secretary Flynn. Then presumably he'll make um, a decision and that will be included in VTrans's budget because I think they're going to have to start making investments in FY21 uh, to get ready for the storage of the train. So anyway, just uh, please let me know if you're, you know, getting poked. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure you probably get some feedback. Yeah. I mean, I just, I'll just say, I suspect that if it, if the recommendation ends up being, you know, Main Street Landing, the waterfront park, that we will see similar challenges with that as we've seen with some other projects. And the likelihood of it actually happening then goes way, way down. And that would be a real shame. It would be unfortunate. Yeah, it's been a long time in coming, and a lot of work has been going into uh, yeah. getting uh, the state ready to get Amtrak back to Burlington. So, Charles, thanks for that work. Do you know how the rail council is going to make this decision? Or are they just putting their finger up in the air? Or do they actually have criteria they have to use in order to come to a conclusion? It's the first time in my couple of years on there that they've been asked to make a recommendation to the secretary. So, uh, it will be interesting. So you don't know the answer to that question? There, are, there is no answer to that question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, there was no direction from the agency about criteria. I'll, I'll say that. And there was no self-generated criteria either. So um, the uh, uh, D, uh, Clean Water Service Provider, this is just, you know, um, we talked some last year about the water quality um, change in law and these clean water service providers um, in the next year or so a and r is going to be working on rulemaking and will participate in that process so you may get some updates and may be asking for some feedback um, you know from the clean water advisory committee and the board um, in terms of taking positions on any draft rulemaking um, so this another heads up uh, audit update the auditors were here at the end of august thanks um, completed. Um, you re may remember FY19, we uh, entered that year with looking at close to a hundred, a negative hundred thousand dollar budget because of the indirect rate fund. And um, we did better than that at the year end. I think we ended up about minus 58, so probably 30 to 40 thousand dollars better than budget. Um, yeah, that sounds much more positive when I say it that way, right? Um, <laughs> Still negative. Yeah, it was negative, but it was but it was better, right? Better than. In the relative scheme of things, we've seen some negative yeah. numbers over the last several years as we've been starting back and forth. Exactly, and then uh, finally, uh, just to let you know, we've, uh, every five years we do a compensation study with staff, and uh, we've just started that process, and that'll be something in front of the executive committee at the end of the calendar year, where we just kind of make sure we're in a good place uh, with regard to staff compensation. So, any questions on that or anything else? But I, oh, Regina. I really have a question. <laughs> okay. Something else? Um, Peter just walked out, but I did want to I was going to, I, I was going to do that. Didn't so, Peter, know. come back in here. I heard Regina. <laughs> so, as I think everyone knows, Peter is retiring in a couple weeks, right? Yeah. End of September will be his last day here. And Peter has been on this. MPO RPC staff for what, 25, 30, 40, 50 years? <laughs> 30, 50, 30, 31 years. 31 years. So, Peter, um, I think it's appropriate that we thank you for all your hard work. You were, boy, involved in so much here and did so much for not only the RPC and the MPO, but the county. Um, just a big thank you and, and good luck to you in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. Mm, I'm a. It's been a great ride. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Regina, did you want to add something, or is? I didn't. We have we have celebrated Peter. We will continue to, it's but I wanted to make a two sure. Two-month celebration. For that's, right. that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I don't think that's indicative of how we feel. That we're glad we're getting rid of him. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, all set. Let's see. So then we've got the committee and liaison activities reports. Nice Those are in your packet. That's right. Any other business? New business? Second. <laughs> so we got Jeff, and we'll give it to Chris. Dual second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Thanks, everyone. 
Um, very interesting conversation at the airport. Boy, the, the very 